Hello, so today we're going to talk about speech recognition, ASR. Um, this is sometimes called speech to text. Um, basically, you have some audio signal, somebody's speaking, and you want to convert it to words. You want to convert it to a text form that can then be used for later processing, be that um, information extraction, um, topic ID, um, dialogue systems, um, some form of giving commands, something like that. Um, you will need standardly, in order to build a system, uh, transcribed audio. So this is recorded audio with the text that describes what that audio actually is. So that's not quite the same as what the person intended to say, but what they actually said, including false starts, hesitations, etc., should ideally be identified. And so that means it isn't just given the red text and, and the audio that goes with it, although we can use with that, that, that we, can, we can still train with that, but it's better if it's actually transcribed over what's actually said. We probably need a pronunciation lexicon as well. So we need to know about the pronunciation of every, every word in the language, given the phoneme set that you've defined for that. I'll come back and talk about that later. And we need a language model. We need to know what's the expected distribution of sequences of words in the language okay and we probably need training data for each of those okay now um this is the ideal case and this is the case for all the big languages and this is what we do all the time in esr but in the multilingual in the low resource case we often don't have these and next lecture i'm going to talk about what do we do when we don't have these how can we substitute them what's the consequences of actually not having them but today i'm going to talk about how we can use these and why we want at least that information, even if that data isn't available. So I'm going to go back in time. Uh, I'm going to try and get you to understand how speech recognition actually works. So um, bear with me while I talk about some of the earlier, actually practical speech recognition. So way back in the early 2000s, um, most cell phones had some form of speech recognition on them, but basically it was simply voice dialing. What you would do is you would record an example of a piece of speech, so mom or dad or Mario's pizza, and then when you want to call that number, you associate it with the actual number, when you wanted to call that, you would say that same phrase again, okay? And what the system would do would match what you said to the pre-recorded example of what you said and try to distinguish between them, okay? So it was a form of template matching. Um, and that's not how speech recognition is done now. And actually, that's not true. And that's why we're talking about this, because we're going to show what the similarity of this is. But this was a very, very simple form. It was one of N. Um, the ends shouldn't be confusable. Um, and uh, some people used it. Most people didn't. I remember trying to use it. It sort of sucked. But um, people would uh, um, at least do that. And at least for some speakers, it would work actually quite well. Um, very importantly, that matching was not done in the time domain. So we're not matching the waveforms to the waveforms. What we're actually doing is matching things in the frequency domain. Because as you saw in, in the last lecture, we um, uh, human ear actually cares about things in the frequency domain. So we want to decompose the signal into its frequency components. This is what's called a spectrogram here. Um, this is easier for us to see the distinctions between the different uh, forms. Um, what, what I can see is here we have a release of the word Bob b, b, at the end of Bob, um, while this person has said mom. Okay, and so there's a little bit of extension on the m on the second uh, m, and I can see that in there. Um, it is uh, normal that we have some variation in there, and this is much easier to try to define the distance and have some distance metric that's going to work in this domain. Doing things in the time domain is probably not the right thing to do because we don't care about the distinctions which are more obvious there. How do we actually match these things though? Well, we match them using our algorithm called dynamic time warping, which I think is one of the coolest possible names for uh, um, algorithm. Unfortunately, it does nothing to do with time travel, even though it, it implies that it's something from Star Trek. Um, what we actually do is we've got the template, okay? So we could have the um, uh, template here of say the word speech and the example before, and what we're matching with the actual person 
uh, example of them saying speech and we're trying to match between them. And what we do is we try to find the best path through this matrix where we're looking at whether we actually match and advance both or match and not advance one. And so we would, could have a value in each of these boxes about how well that particular path goes. Um, we have to do this because when you speak, you never, absolutely unquestionably never say it at the same speed as you did it before. Now, okay, there might be rare exception cases that that happen, but in general, you don't really control your speech. And in fact, you really don't control your speech at that level. We're probably talking of units here in about the 10 millisecond form. And unless it's a pre-recorded speech and played back, it's really not the same thing at all. Okay, we always have variation in our speech. So we've got to deal with the time variation, which means we can't just look down that diagonal match because it won't match. And so what we need to do is we need to sometimes use up more of the template and sometimes use up more of the sample. And so we have to choose between them. So we do this with the dynamic time warping algorithm. Um, it's actually relatively simple. And all we have to do is we have to look at the best point to say one part of our matrix. And what we can do is we can look at the previous of not advancing one and saying, is that a better score, um, cumulative score than advancing the other or advancing both at the same time, okay? Um, it's the string edit distance you've probably seen in, um, in NLP, um, uh, but uh, we're applying it to speech, but it's basically the same thing. And it works pretty well for some number of templates. So what we would do is we have the sample that we're actually speaking and we have some template library. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna test each of those, find the distance metric and choose which of these templates it actually is, okay? Remember I'm talking about words or maybe small numbers of multi words like Mario's pizza. Um, and you want to probably in the DTW voice dialing days, you were sort of restricted to maybe 10, 20 at the very most. Because remember, the more you have of those, the more computational expensive it is to test them. So if you had 100 of them, you'd have to test 100 every time. And that could be computationally expensive, especially for on a, on a phone with a really poor processor on it. Um, and also, the other problem is the more templates you have, the more likely you are to have a mismatch. So you're more likely to have uh, some confusable pair in there. Um, you also have to deal with the fact once if there's no match, what happens if nothing is there? So you can't just select the one with the closest match. You have to make a decision about that's eh, outside the possibility. So we have these templates, we're trying to match them. We want to make sure that, that we can distinguish them. We want to make sure that when it's not one of those. Now you can cheat when you're doing templates and what you can say is um, uh, the templates must be different and you could even test it at record time and say is this new template any different um, uh, or different enough from the other templates and so you could do something like that but if you did that in speech that would mean you'd only have a few um, select ways of saying things that weren't confusable and that's not really what we want with speech we want that confusability to be minimized as much as possible. So we want more context or something to be able to distinguish between them. Um, for this distance metric, we could just use a simple Euclidean distance, but that's not ideal um, because depending on the thing we're matching, the magnitude of the numbers we got get could be very different. Silence is pretty similar to other silence. So you, no matter what the silence is, it's gonna be a small number. Um, fricatives like shh and f actually typically get a large score. So, you know, if you had a, if, if the template has got a short shh and the human said a long shh, you might actually get a bigger distance metric when that's not really fair because the expectation of shh would be bigger. Okay, while vowels might be closer to each other and doesn't matter when they're length difference. So and therefore that could vary the, the magnitude of the difference more than what you'd really like it to be. So what you could do is you could actually get multiple examples of the template and you could try to align them to each other and you could try to find out what the mean distance actually is. In fact, you could collect the mean and the variance. So you could actually collect a Gaussian 
for what the distri distribution would be. So instead of having a template that's just got a single example, you have a template that's actually got a Gaussian model for each of the frames that are in there. So you end up with means and standard deviations for that. That's going to be more reliable because you've got the person to say it multiple times um, in the template. And you can maybe, even if you're clever, actually update it on the fly as the person actually speaks it. Um, although usually in phone dialing systems, they would never do that because that's computationally too expensive. Um, so instead of using Euclidean distance, we could use Malhalanobis distance. So we could actually divide by the standard deviation. So the problem of distances in the sh domain versus difference in the R domain sort of go away because we're going to take in the expected um, difference between these and effectively have a normalization. So that should give a more reliable measure. So basically now that we've got a template that actually has a model in it, Gaussians, um, then we actually could get more reliable, um, a, more reliable matches, okay? Um, so we do that. Or we would like to do that. Actually, typically on phones, we didn't do this because it was too hard and too computationally expensive to do something like this. But I'm trying to lead from the DTW stuff into, into modern um, uh, speech recognition and showing that this would help your template. Okay. So with the more reliable measure, we could actually start caring about having more templates because if you have templates in the simplest DTW case, you start having overlap because the mean distance between things gets, well, there's more things to have distance between and keeping the separation gets hard. So instead of having templates that are words, we could actually go down to phonemes. So instead of having a template for the word cat, dog, fox, et cetera, we could actually have templates for k and a uh, and t, okay? And that would sort of work, okay? But uh, there's a number of issues that we'd have to deal with this. One issue is that in an original form of templates, we were dealing with isolated words or maybe small numbers of words in Mario's pizza. Um, and therefore, we didn't really have to care much about the beginning and end, and we didn't have to care about merging. But when you're talking about phonemes, we speak them together. We don't put spaces between them. We don't speak them in isolation. We don't say we want to say the word cat. We don't say k, a, ah, t, okay? But if you did that, then you might be able to use DTW. But here, we're actually going to get cat altogether. And therefore, we have to worry about even more variance, and our DGW will get even more com complex because it's actually a string of templates that you're going to have to match. And that means that you're going to get more dynamics with respect to that. And so maybe you'd have to restrict how close to the diagonal you expect it to be. But you know, because you've got these little short things, uh, which could vary quite substantially with especially the T at the end, um, uh, which might even just be a glottal stop and therefore not actually have the release of the sound. It might just be a cat um, uh, in, in um, Southern British English. That's perfectly reasonable. Um, and uh, that might even get harder to be able to match. But that idea of having a template for every single phoneme is what modern speech recognition is all about. We would like to have templates for each of these phonemes, and we'd like to be able to match, maybe not actually DTW, but something like that, to given an example that somebody says. So we're stringing together these templates and trying to actually recognize what's um, going on. Okay. But uh, there's always a but. Okay. You probably learned this. Um, phonemes in a language phones in the language are not just um, isolated. They're not actually simply concatenated together. They're actually contextualized. So depending on the phonemes round about them, that phone gets affected. Now, it's in a way that you as a human, when you're listening to it, have learned to be able to get rid of and don't even notice that thing happening. But when our machines look at it, they get utterly confused. So for example, if you think of the word C and the word so, the word so is uh, got lip rounding in it and the word C does not. But let's actually try to uh, move in on the first uh, phoneme there, which is the S sound. So in the, the so case, you actually round your lips at the beginning. So you say sh 
with rounded lips. While in the other case, you say s uh, for C. Now, you don't care about the difference between these two noises, but they're different. And so the machine trying to match whether s and s are the same or not uh, could get confused because that distance uh, between those may actually be important in some other phoneme. So it doesn't know that these should be treated the same way and they are in fact in the same class rather than they should be separated. So actually what we really probably care about is the context that all phones are in. So we introduced this notion of what's called a triphone. And a triphone is not a trigram. It's not three phones. We deliberately pick terms which are confusable so that we can ask term, ask the meaning of these terms in exams. Okay, it, there's not going to be an exam in this class. And that's not the reason at all. It's just people come up with cool terms and they actually overlap in all the wrong ways. Um, but triphones are a contextualized phone. So a triphone is a single phone. Okay, but we identify that phone with what phone came before it and what phone came after it. So it's just talking about its context. We're not including that context in a representation. We're just identifying that particular phone with its um, phone before and its phone after. And so these are called triphones. So how many triphones are there? Well, if we have 45 English phonemes in ASR, which we have approximately, um, it'd be 45 times 45 times 45, which is 91,000. Uh, if we want to get an example of all these triphones, and let's say I need at least 10 examples in order to be able to get um, a, a reasonable model, okay, that and it's 80 milliseconds per phone on average, which it maybe is, um, that's 2,200 hours of speech, which is quite a lot of speech. Um, but that's also making the naive assumption that all phones are equiprobable and all triphones are equiprobable, and they're not. Um, in fact, I can give you a triphone that never exists, okay? Well, apart from when I say it now, um, and that's oi, oi, oi. And in fact, I didn't really say it as a triphone because I actually put boundaries between it and I actually put silence in there, so it's oi, oi, oi. And yay, maybe some Yiddish-speaking New Yorker might say something like that, but it's pretty rare, okay? Um, I have one of my little anecdotes here. I remember I was looking for not triphones, but diphones, which are not contextualized phones, but two phones together. And I was looking for an example of oi oi together to put in my speech synthesizer. And I searched all of the Wall Street Journal data that I had to try to find an example of oi oi, a natural example of oi oi, and found none over five years of the Wall Street Journal. Never appeared. So I then searched my email, which I thought was maybe going to be more varied in some way. And I found an example in, in my email of, I don't know, 10 years of email. It's probably more than that at the time. I found an example. So I looked at the email message about what it was. And the example was toy oyster. I'm thinking, why would I ever talk about toy oyster in my email? So I looked at the actual email message rather than the context it came from. And it was from a friend of mine who was saying, I'm trying to find an example of oi oi for, to record for my synthesizer, but can't find any at all. So I just made one up of toy oyster. So in other words, it doesn't actually exist naturally, uh, probably. Well, except soy oil, I think is an example of it. But that wasn't in the Wall Street Journal or my email. So some of these are really rare and some of these are ridiculously common. Um, like eh in ing is incred incredibly common because um, uh, it appears almost all the time. Um, but you would need more than 200 hours distribution to be able to get reasonable, and you're not going to find them all, but you can collapse some of them, okay? You'd like to find examples, but you're not going to find them, and so you have to get enough examples so that you can build a reasonable model, and the ones that you don't have a reasonable model for, you have enough data that's maybe not a full triphone, but you start putting some of the triphones together in some way. Now, all forms of speech recognition care about contextualized phones. Sometimes explicitly, they call them triphones, um, and sometimes implicitly in the neural form where it's actually caring about the context and um, building internal models that might not be actually visible to us within the neural net, but it's doing it. So you want data that has that variation in it, and that's important. How do you train an acoustic model? Well. 
um, you need text and you need to know the pronunciations because you're really worried about the phonetic representation, the noise, the, the, the um, segmental part of it. That's what's actually said, not what you think is said. So you really would like if a, a speech and somebody to go in and actually label what the speech says, not what you think it says. Now, sometimes it might not be accurate. And so you could deal with audiobooks where they may not actually say what's in the text, but they say something close to it. Um, maybe it's even output of some other speech recognizer that's given you these forms and therefore is even more noisy. But I'm talking about what you really want and to make training better, you want to have good transcriptions of what's actually going on. Um, you want the audio and you want the audio not just in a standard, um, the same format all the way through, but you would like it to be in the same um, channel that you're ultimately going to be. If it's telephone speech, you want it to be telephone speech. If you want a wideband, if you want it to be a close talking microphone, you want to care about that. Or if it's far field, you want to care about that. You want the population to be the population you'd expect it to do recognition with. So it's the same type of people with the same type of accent speaking in the same type of way, which almost always is never the case for your application. So you've got to do some compromise there to have the data you have and, and just see how well you can do it and then care about that later. Um, how much do you need? How many hours do you need? And the answer is, well, it's always better with more. It's almost always better with more. I've seen people claim that once you get to 10,000 hours, which is probably more speech than you've heard, I mean, maybe not in your whole life, but it's definitely more than you heard in your first 10 years of your life. Um, it, uh, would 10,000, yeah, maybe not worth it, or maybe we don't know good training techniques for dealing with 10,000 hours of speech yet, but thousands of hours is good. You know, if you've got 3,000 hours, you're going to get a good um, uh, system out of it. But we typically don't have that for all but the um, uh, most common languages or most technological or um, uh, economically viable languages on the planet. So maybe the top five, okay? Um, hundreds of hours is pretty good, um, and you can do pretty well with speech recognition. Again, you know, you, you're you going to get worse on things that are outside the training set, okay? That's always going to be the case. 20 hours, you can still do something reasonable with 20 hours. It wasn't that long ago in the 90s when we were training speech recognition, which wasn't very good. Um, uh, we could get by with 20 hours, okay? Um, sometimes we have even less than that, like one hour of the targeted um, language, and then you've probably got to do some form of adaptation. I'll talk about that in the next uh, way. So you've got some pre-trained model that you've got that's generalized acoustics, and then you're going to do um, adaptation to the target language. And also, we can be in the position where we have absolutely no data at all. Um, and then you really have to use a model from some other language or some language independent model, which can sort of work. Um, it's never as good as training on thousands of hours of speech, but it might allow you to start being able to do something. Um, remember what we were actually trying to do. We really are trying to get these DTW-like template models and train them. We're trying to get a model of these different contextualized phonemes, okay? Now, we can let the model be um, really interesting, and it can decide which contextualized phoneme and context it should care about. But we want to have those examples, okay? That's why we have training. And so if we don't have that training, it's not going to be very good. So for example, going back to the one hour and zero hour examples, if you're trying to do cross-lingual things, sometimes the triphone stuff trained on one language is bad when you do it on another because the way people concatenate phonemes, which you might think are the same cross-lingually, actually often the transitions between them are actually quite different between different languages and dialects. And so sometimes when you're doing the cross-lingual recognition, monophones rather than triphones, so monophones without the context can be better, even though they're worse for the target language, they may be better um, for another language. You should be aware of that and think about that when you're doing the next homework that's coming out. Um, when you're training all of your data, the standard way that we used to do it with HMMs is uh, expectation maximization generalization called Van Welsh. And basically what we do is we um, uh, naively align the data 
collect statistics and then effectively re-recognize um, the data and we gradually move to conversion. It takes some time to train, but so does the modern um, neural equivalent. Um, with the neural equivalent, we don't explicitly name, and that's not completely true. We don't need to ex explicitly name the triphones, although some of the recognizers actually do. Um, all of the neural forms are recognized from aligned data that comes from the older system. So there's a history of all these systems for the last you know, 30 years, um, <coughs> which makes it sometimes difficult when you're starting from scratch in a new language and you don't have anything to um, have your initial labeling, but sometimes you can get by with that. The neural form still has a problem that if your data is very noisy and there's a mismatch between the text and the audio, or there's extra things in the audio or extra things in the text, the alignment won't work very well and therefore it will fail. And that's always been a problem with both Van Welsh and neural forms of like, eh, didn't find the alignment and therefore couldn't actually build um, the model. And therefore sometimes when we're doing things, especially with low resource, we try to get, we try to only include data that's very well aligned. So we might actually use an HMM technique to check the alignment before we give it to the neural form, especially if we've got a small amount of data. Also, the longer the sentences, the harder it is to align because the more likely are you're gonna get a mismatch the longer you actually are. And so we try to make these into sort of phrasal forms with silence at the beginning and end. And that can also have problems in trying to find out how that aligns with the text, especially in audiobooks or um, broadcast news. Somehow you have to know where the text is with respect to the split that you actually made in the audio, but you don't have a speech recognizer yet because you're going to train it uh, and there's a bootstrapping problem. There are answers to that and there are, it's worth doing that um, when you've got really low um, uh, resource and you're, you're starting from scratch. Um, it's not just acoustics, okay? When humans speak, they do not just use acoustics. They actually depend on the expected words as well. So although we're trying to get the probability of the words given the observations, the acoustics, we can actually decompose that with Bayes' into the probability of the words and the probability of the observations given the words, this is the Bayes' rule, divided by the probability of observations. We're actually looking for the art max of this. So we don't care about the probability of the observation because that's effectively going to be a, context, a, 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 a constant for any particular utterance, so which is good because we don't really know what the probability of um, uh, author of the danger trail, Philip Steeles, etc., is in the world of the universe of possible sentences we can say. And that's a really hard thing to calculate. So um, it's good that we can just ignore that. And then we've got these two components, and this one is just the probability of the words, independent of the observations. So this we can actually model with a language model. So we can go and look at all of the possible words that exist in the language. We can look at the sequences of them and we can actually get something out of that. Nowadays, this is called pre-training. Um, it's also called language model, it's still called language model. And then we can talk about the acoustic model that's actually dealing with the probability of observations. Can watch, notice it's the other way around if you're dealing with an actual probabilistic model. Let's talk a little bit about the language model. Um, you want to train it from appropriate. It's nice that it's a separate model, but it's going to be appropriate. So if you're going to do conversational Twitter um, type things and you train from the Wall Street Journal, it's not really going to be right because they're different. We talked about that last week, the difference between speech and text. And so if your text is well edited um, uh, in prose, uh, it's not going to be right. Um, language models don't have to be at the word level. They can be some token BPE um, level. They can be some character or phone level. That's just absolutely fine. Um, and it's up to the type of data that you have, whether you want to do that. Character phone things can actually be better. Actually, really, most of the time, we're really doing it to phone, but we collect the statistics at the word level and then project them into phones in the actual recognizer. Um, so we're exploiting this concept of pre-trained models. It's great to have a pre-trained model because there's an awful lot more information than you will ever get in your actual whole training set, in your acoustic training set. So it's a good thing to do. I mean, that's why people want thousands of hours because they're actually trying to compensate for the fact that they don't have a pre-trained model that will cover their um, uh, distribution. Because if you do have thousands of hours of acoustic data, you sort of have a good language model in there already. Um, often you can use multiple models and combine them, and that's actually a really good thing to do. So you have a global universal model behind you, you have a target one for your application. 
Um, language models traditionally are smooth trigram. That's trigram, three words, not um, a, um, not like the triphone thing. It's a different word, even though it looks like it's the same. Trigram model, uh, smooth um, with back off. And traditionally, that's what we used forever. We now use neural models because they can deal with longer context a little better. Um, what's interesting is this misses everything to do with grammaticality or relevance to the particular context, which do make a difference. But actually, that's not really what's important to most of the recognition algorithms. Locally, there's an awful lot of confusion about what words it could be. And this relatively local um, constraint makes a big difference to the recognizer. So the reason that a few words context actually works in speech recognition is because, well, that's the thing that we found to work. So there's some evolutionary um, thing that we've decided that, that actually works well. Um, it may get wrong long-term context, but maybe that doesn't matter for the type of confusion that happens in speech recognition. Um, uh, the separate language model is great because it allows good use of other um, data, it can boost performance, um, uh, but there probably is, in fact, there almost always is language model um, and acoustic model difference. The language model, you know, you train a Wikipedia, and that's not what the people said, it does different word distribution, and therefore it's not as appropriate as you would like it to be. And so that's a bad thing, okay? Um, that difference may be a good thing or not, it really depends. And what often happens is you end up tuning the weighting between the, your systems on how much you depend on the language model and how much you depend on the acoustic model, depending on which one you trust more, okay? Or which one is closer to your particular application. It could be that the acoustic model you have is a whole bunch of telephone speech about people um, discussing politics, and then you're going to use it for a telephone dialogue system to get the weather, and that's not really going to be important. So you want to actually boost the language model on there, because that's going to tell you more about it than what the acoustics are, and you could modify that over time, depending on um, uh, how good your results actually are. The pronunciation model, um, speech recognition doesn't work unless it knows what the pronunciation of the actual words are. So the word has to be in the vocabulary. Yes, there are people who do recognition of unknown words, but in general, you have to know the word vocabulary. So if your name is unusual, forget it. You're gonna to have to change your name to John, okay? Um, so we need a pronunciation, okay? Um, so the word pencil has got to go to the string of phonemes that are actually there. One of the largest English um, sets, and remember English is one of the hardest languages to pronounce. Um, it's a little unfortunate that it also becomes a very common language in the world, but the relationship between the writing system and the um, pronunciation is um, not arbitrary, but it almost is arbitrary. Um, and that makes it very hard compared to other languages. So CMU Dict was collected in the 1990s and updated various times after that. There's about 150,000 words in it. It's very good at proper names, probably better than most other proper dictionaries. Um, uh, they don't usually concentrate on names. Um, and so it's good for actual speech. Um, it also has quite a lot of Indian and um, Chinese names because it often covers many of the graduate students at CMU. Um, so it has quite good distribution for that. It's not always consistent because different people have added things and there's not a standard actual phonetic choice because there's sort of slightly different ways of not just saying things, but choosing what you're going to do. And so it has a little bit of noise in it. It's much less of a problem than it was in the 90s. Um, but this is really good. In fact, almost all commercial systems are derived from that. Um, uh, and sometimes so are the bugs in it. Um, a, what happens if you don't have one? Well, you can use the graphemes. It sort of works. Even for English, it sort of works if you have enough data, because there still is a pronunciation relationship to the um, forms. Um, or you can use something like Epitran. This is David Mor Mortensen's thing that will give, given the language, um, it will give you some phonetic representation. It's not always right, but it's much better than nothing. Um, and it's a little bit more consistent cross-lingually. Um, all of this is derived from the Unicode standard where there is an ASCII representation or pronunciation of every character in, um, in Unicode, except the Latin ones and the Latin plus plus ones. Um, uh, so you get pronunciation for Devnagari or Tamil or whatever, um, and that's actually a good place to start. It, 
it's not always correct and it's usually done language independently so if the writing system is used for lots of different languages um, then it's it it isn't very good and remember if you're using um japanese korean um and chinese uh, you don't want to use epitran you want to go and get a pronunciation opinion uh, probably in order to be able to um, do that how do you measure success we well, use word error rate word error rate is uh, edit distance um, uh, substitutions, deletions, and assertions um, uh, times 100. Um, this means that the word error rate can be bigger than 100%. It's not a good thing when it's bigger than 100%, but it can be. Um, uh, so how good is good? Well, read speech, dictation, form, and good performance, somebody who knows how to use the system, you probably want it to be less than 5% word error rate. And that will usually be the case, okay? Otherwise, people won't use it. If you get one word wrong in every sentence or so, eh, people will stop using it. In a spoken dialogue system on a telephone, for example, you can go up to 30% word error, error rate, and it's still okay-ish, okay? It depends on which word it is, but usually the words it gets wrong are the words like the and a and m, and that's not very important to the actual content. I um, would like... Uh, the next bus to um, Squirrel Hill from CMU. The only important words in there are bus, Squirrel Hill, CMU, if it's a bus information system. And it doesn't matter if you get the other ones wrong because you've still got the core information. And in a dialogue system, you can say, do you want the next bus from CMU to Squirrel Hill um, or the other way around? Um, and that's fine, okay? And you, because you get confirmation. So that works okay. Drunk friends and outside busy cafe is probably up to 80% word error rate. So you make it topic ID, but that's going to be hard, okay? But we know that that's actually going to be hard, okay? But maybe the conversation that these people are saying isn't very important, not saying that, not for my drunk friends. Um, uh, remember, collecting data in your actual application is really this the thing, and everybody does this. So they deploy a system, and then they start collecting in-domain data, because in-domain data is always better than any model or any data you get elsewhere. So. That's actually what people do and how to get it from going from 50% word error rate into down to something that's actually much more practical. So what I've talked about is the ASR components, acoustic model for transcribed data, pronunciation model from an explicit lexicon, and a language model from text data, okay? Um, we want training to contain the phones and all the context and from all speakers. We're never going to get that. So we want as near to that as possible because that's what's going to give us a better um, model. Word error rate is used as standard measure. Lower is better, of course. Applications may interpret the ASR output even with 30% word error rate. And I don't think humans do better than 5% word error rate, actually, um, for most of the time. Um, in the next lecture, Although I've identified these really strong um, components, I'm going to actually talk about how can you do speech recognition when you do not have these components. Or you have these components, but they're not very good because you don't have enough data. in. And finally, the discussion point. OK, so we require these three models, acoustic model, pronunciation model, and language model. But what I'd like you to do is for languages that you know where these three components have different relative importance. OK, so depending on the language and maybe the dialect and maybe the application, but let's at least talk at the language level, maybe some of these are more important than others. So, for example, in Spanish, the pronunciation model isn't really important uh, because for the most part, you can just use the letters because it's pretty phonetic. It's not 100 percent and it has borrowed English words in it, which are always a problem. Um, but you don't really need to care so much about the pronunciation model okay well let's talk about arabic because when it's spoken it's spoken in a dialect that's in other um languages and environments it would be treated as a different language it's a related language to what's actually written which is modern standard arabic and therefore your language model using modern standard arabic would not be as appropriate for doing your dialect so these are two examples and i'd like to come up with others for us okay Thank you.